In today's episode, I am joined by Steve Ankerstar. Steve has served 20 years as an Air Force fighter pilot, and now he serves his clients and their families in both cultivating and preserving their wealth and financial well-being. Steve is the owner of Afterburner Financial, a wealth management firm in Austin, Texas. Steve dropped the first bomb of the shock and awe campaign in 2003 from an F-117 stealth fighter at the beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Welcome, Steve. All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Jacob, for having me on today. Amazing. My pleasure. So, Steve, tell us a little bit about um, Operation, I, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. So, tell us a little bit about that and what it's like driving that uh, stealth fighter. Sure, you bet. Uh, so, in the States, we had 9-11 happened in uh, 2001. So, after the, uh, the terrorist attack happened, the United States went into, you know, who's going to pay for this mode? And we kind of, you know, got all our intel communities together and we were starting to try to find out who was responsible. And it took a little while because if you, anytime there's a terrorist attack, it, it's interesting that like all the terrorist groups take credit for it, right? Because they want credibility. So all the, you know, all the bit terrorists that are out there were saying uh, we did it. So we had to sort through a lot of stuff as, as a country. Um, but basically, uh, we went over and we finally attributed it to Osama bin Laden. Uh, we went to Afghanistan and he found some terrorist camps, training camps that he had over there. And we took some military action against him in, the, in Afghanistan. However, there was a larger problem at play, and that was Saddam Hussein and what he was doing with Iraq. So in late 2002, early 2003, uh, President Bush, uh, the younger one, uh, at the time started talking about how we were going to go over there and remove Saddam Hussein from power. And through long story short, in March of that year, uh, our Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, came up with this shock and awe campaign, uh, which I think he just liked the name. Uh, we were going to continue, do continuous uh, bombing campaign around the clock until uh, Saddam Hussein basically surrendered and uh, gave himself up, and then that would be the end of it. Uh, it didn't exactly play out like uh, Secretary Rumsfeld had hoped, because he didn't just give up. Uh, but that's why I was over there. And again, I trained for my whole life to be able to go do something like that and uh, flew the airplane. It's a black triangle. It's the one over my shoulder up there, if you, if you can see it. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a stealth fighter. So you sneak in, uh, you use it on night one of the war. It's kind of like uh, we say a kicker in the football game. Uh, you, get, you go in first and you poke out the eyes and ears of the enemy uh, th through using bombs. And uh, that way you bring their defenses down and then you can bring other types of uh, firepower in behind you. Wow, that sounds really intense. Uh, something I've never really experienced in my whole life. I mean, the only fighter plane I ever saw was once when I was in Florida and I was just about to go off on a cruise ship and there was an aircraft carrier right beside the cruise ship. Yeah. And I could not believe the noise that thing made and <laughs> the speed at which it went flying. It was crazy. I was like, oh my God, I feel like a little kid again, you know, seeing those things. You know, it's kind of something kids dream about when they're younger, like I'd love to fly one of those jets, right? So how did you kind of get started into that? Was that something you always knew you wanted to do was be a fighter pilot? Or is that something that kind of got pushed on you? Like explain a little bit more. Sure. Uh, I would have to piggyback off of the all that noise you heard uh, when you were down there in Florida. <laughs> That's the afterburner section of the uh, of the airplane and what the afterburner does is of course you have that big flame that shoots out the back that allows it to go so fast is it it really takes raw fuel so you have the normal engine with the fuel going through it and then yeah. it just takes raw fuel and dumps it into the afterburner stage and that's what wow. a a makes so much noise and b allows you to go so so fast uh, so quickly uh, but as far as being a fighter pilot i grew up uh, my dad was in the air force so i was considering the military um, that kind of works out like that uh, but it was the, I liked math a lot and I'd kind of convinced myself I was going to go into investing and I uh, wanted an engineering degree because I wanted to know how things worked. And then I'm like, I'll end up investing somewhere. I got started in high school. So it was pretty, you know, I was like, that's what I want to do. And then my junior year of high school, I went to the movies with my best friend, Mike, and saw a movie called Top Gun. <laughs> and once I saw Top Gun, I walked out of the movie and it literally changed my life. I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. My friend laughed and said, okay, buddy. Uh, went home, told my parents, and they're like, well, that's nice, but uh, let's, you know, <laughs> let's do good in school and have a backup plan. You know, much like if one of your kids would tell you something crazy like that. 
but I really, that was what I wanted to do. And I, it took me almost a decade to go from when I saw the movie to where I was actually flying fighters. Um, but that's, you know, I, I could see myself in that role. And then I kind of planned it out, you know, what are the, I like to call the 10,000 hurdles between where I am today and my goal years down the road. And I, I got to it and ma- made my childhood dream actually uh, happen. Nice, nice. So what's kind of like the process of going through to be a fighter pilot? Like, I'm sure it's not just like show up at, you know, fighter camp or whatever (laughs) it is. And it's like, okay, and this is how you fly a plane, you know, (laughs) right? What's the kind of process to get into that? Well, sure. Kind of the, the, the short version of it is everybody in the United States and most countries, you have to be a college graduate before you can even start flight school. There are, com- there are countries out there that start right out of high school uh, with a very select few or royalty in the Middle East can go right into fighters at, at age mm-hmm. of 18. But usually in most of what, are, what I would call the Western uh, countries, you're about 22, 23 or so. Uh, you have a college degree, not always in engineering, but that generally helps if it's numbers-based uh, background, but not, a, not everybody. And then you spend a year uh, at pilot training. Well, you have to apply. And that's kind of the hardest hurdle to get over is that you have to get selected. Um, but once you get selected, you train for about a year on how to learn how to fly just a couple trainer aircraft. And then you spend another six months learning how to fly your fighter aircraft. So from start to finish, about two years from the time you start pilot training, you could find yourself over the skies of hostile territory actually employing your airplane. Wow. That seems really crazy to me. Is it... Um... This is just the kid in me asking this question. Is it like, <laughs> is it like the video games, you know, like the old ones that you'd play and it would have like the targeting system and all that kind of stuff. Is it similar to that or is it completely different? No, the video games are actually pretty spot on. It's wow. pretty much a, a, car- a carbon copy of what you see in the airplane. Um, I started off in the F-15, which is the air to air fighter. Uh, so fly up at 30,000 feet and above and protect everybody. Uh, and of course, if enemy enemy airplanes come out to play, then you uh, make sure they either uh, go away or end up in the dirt. Um, so that's where I started. And you're right, all of these skills that it takes to be good at Fighter Ace, you know, 2020 or whatever the popular games are now, uh, those really apply. Um, obviously, when you're flying an airplane, you do have the 360 degree visibility and you have to be able to fly looking backwards and some things you don't get with the video game. Um, but from the air to air perspective, it's pretty accurate. And then for the bomb droppings or the air to ground perspective, yeah, it's you, you fly in and you see the target in your in your HUD there and it's got a little uh, box around it. And it's got a little, you know, triangle up top and it starts flashing at you when you're in range. And it, it's it's pretty accurate. Wow. Well, I don't think I'd make a good fighter pilot. I was never good at those games. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell folks, uh, you know, that I talked to a lot of youth groups and folks are, you know, the young kids are like, well, how can I go do that? And it's like, we well, have to be really good at math and you have to be really good at video games. And pretty much all they hear is good at video games. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then they go home and they think they're going to be a fighter pod because they're uh, sitting in the basement, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> slaying, what, slaying whatever computer game they play. It's like, yeah, it's not quite that easy, but you do need to have good, uh, pretty pretty good uh, hand-eye coordination to be able to to do it for sure i never would have thought that math was something that was really important for fighting uh for being a fighter pilot um what kind of training like would people need to know like is it like advanced calculus that you need to know or like what specific math for someone who may be interested in being a fighter pilot like what kind of specialty did you need to go into for that it's really it's uh, it's math of all kinds uh, when it when it gets right down to it. So there's the basics math of um, I have so much fuel in the airplane and I'm bu- I'm burning so many you know gallons a minute. So therefore, how many minutes do I have before I have to go back home? You know, those are kind of the basics of aviation and how fast am I going and how far it is to my target means how long I have to you know it'll take to get yeah. there. Uh, that sort of stuff's pretty easy. But when you get in the air to air world, when you are not necessarily, you know, down is not always, the ground is not always down. <laughs> so when you're fighting each other, you fight in relation to the other airplane. So you'll be generally looking over your shoulder or hopefully the other guy's looking over his shoulder back at you. Um, you can be fighting in all kinds of different axes uh, at all times. And you have to be able to think in relation to each other. And the example that I use for folks is, If my airplane, if you and I are pretty equal skilled fighter pilots um, and my airplane can turn 28 degrees a second and yours can turn 27 degrees a second, uh, I know I'm going to beat you. All I have to do is be patient because my jet can slowly outperform yours. 
Now, if it's reversed, and I know that you're in a slightly better airplane, then I can't just fight normally. I have to do something different to change the games, to change the numbers behind all of it. Um, so it, it, it can work both ways there, but being able to keep track of not only where, you know, the person you're fighting is, but all of the other airplanes that are out there, it, it's really, it, it can be, uh, you have to train to it for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I never, you know, it makes me think of those like math problems in grade nine, you know, if you have this many oranges and you're going this, this direction at this speed, you know, how long is it going to take you to get here? You know, that's the kind of stuff, you know, the real right. world application for those things that you don't think are important, but if you want to be a fighter pilot, it's important. Yeah. Um, so take it to the next level where, you know, the train leaving <laughs> the station and the other train, well, then this train shoots a missile that's going at a different speed. And this guy shoots a missile going. That, so then you have the weapons that you have to factor in oh there, too. Goodness. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And I used to teach um, younger fighter pilots, you know, how to, how to fly at faster speeds and, and get better. Yeah. And I would say that for, for most people, they have about, you know, what you're used to in your car. You have about an 80, 90 mile an hour brain. So if you were to go out today in your car and go 120 miles an hour, you'd be very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. most people would and breaking the law but you know, <laughs> take the, the law aside just from a speed perspective your brain isn't trained to operate that way and it's not that it can't it's just never been trained to yeah. so we take folks that are trained to the you know 80 miles an hour and then we teach them to fly at 200 miles an hour and then 400 miles an hour and then 600 miles an hour and then supersonic wow. and eventually once you've trained them it's pretty amazing how uh, how the human mind can process all of that but it it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, for sure. Definitely takes a lot of practice and, and getting used to going that fast. I mean, I couldn't right. even imagine going that fast for myself, right? <laughs> but it'd be something wicked to try. Like, I'd love to do it. Um, but let's kind of move uh, down a little bit and let's talk about your business. So you're a, you're a sure. financial planner and you help people find that financial freedom, which is amazing. So uh, can you give us a little bit of an overview of what your company does and how it services your clients? Sure. Uh, I called it Afterburner Financial because I wasn't quite ready to uh, to let go of the flying, you know, flying fighters community. Uh, so I do wear a black flight suit uh, with my yeah. patches on it. And uh, um, it, my clients get a kick out of that. I would say about a third of my clients are pilots. So I kind of, you know, nice. it's my natural client base. And I use flying analogies. So uh, what I use for folks that are only fly in like civilian airplanes is, you know, I'm like a, like the pilot for an airline is, you know, you, you hire me to take you from A, which is where you are, to B, which is to whatever retirement you foresee for yourself. And then I have to do that safely. So hopefully, if I'm really good, you just fall asleep in the back and enjoy the ride and do whatever you want. But if we do run into trouble, then I help uh, help work through that, navigate the, uh, the threats to your retirement. So the first part is the basic financial planning. And not everybody needs financial planning. Um, sometimes I, I would say about the time you turn 40, and generally, that's when things start getting pretty complex to where uh, you might want to reach out for help. Um, everybody can do this sort of stuff themselves. It's whether they want to take the time and they have the inclination to, to do it. Um, and you have to kind of like math a little bit. Uh, but that's the financial planning piece. And then the other side of it's investment management. Uh, so I do both of those. And Excellent. for investment management, it's, uh, you know, we talk about your risk tolerance and, and see you know, what kind of investor are you? And then once we figure out what type of investor are, you are, how to maximum perform, just like you do in a fighter airplane, mm -hmm. you're trying to get maximum performance at all times. How can we do that for your portfolio? So you, you know, if you can make a percent or two more uh, than everybody else, you have to, you know, that means you get to retire a few years earlier. So right. it, it's really both of those things that I do for folks. Nice. So I saw when I was looking through your website a little bit, I saw that your core values are integrity, transparency, and efficiency. Now, what does that mean for you? And what does it mean for your clients? Sure. Uh, integrity. And again, I like to think that uh, being in the military is a great background for uh, financial folks, because you, when you meet with somebody, they're literally considering turning over their entire net worth to you. <laughs> uh, I call it the open kimono moment. Um, to where folks kind of they have to talk about things that not everybody's necessarily comfortable, right? It's just like, well, drop your kimono and I'll drop mine, and we, you know, we'll figure figure out figure things out. But folks have to to share things that 
may or may not be comfortable. Um, so we, we start, we start from there and they need to be able to trust you. And that's what I always tell clients or when I'm speaking, I say, Hey, find somebody you can trust. That's far more important than if they're actually any good. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally you'd want to trust them and they would be yeah. good, <laughs> but if either of the two, you want somebody that you can trust, um, and you resonate with. So if you like talking with somebody, that's great. If you mm -hmm. like talking to somebody else, then go with them. Um, so that's the first part of it. And then transparency is there's the financial community since about the 80s has kind of run amok is what I say um, with the big financial firms and the big skyscrapers downtown and the uh, we're smart, you're dumb type of philosophy. And I don't like that at all. Um, I think that and they've made a lot of money with that, you know, brainwashing everybody through their advertising of, hey, you can't you can't do better than the averages. So don't even try. Just hand over your money and willingly pay fees for the next 40 to 60 years uh, for doing so. So it's like, yeah, I don't resonate with that at all. So with my clients, the transparency is I charge one flat fee um, for the assets under management. And, you know, basically any anything the client wants to know, it's like right there, open book uh, for nice. them so they know. And then the last one is efficiency. It's kind of where I go back to flying uh, analogies is uh, fees are the things that are like drag on an airplane. So I have one fee where another financial advisor like at Edward Jones, who has their fee, and then they put you in a bunch of mutual funds or index funds, and every single one of those has a fee. So you're, you're literally paying like 30 fees, or, or I like to call it 30 little fingers uh, <laughs> in your pot of money. And it's like, no, there should be like one set, right? That, that, and that's the person you work with. Um, so when I, when I use that, I generally know pretty quick with somebody if, uh, if I'm saying those things and they start nodding their heads, so then, then we're probably going to, yeah. you know, work well together. And if they kind of do the, hmm, I don't know, then it's like, okay, well, no, no worries. You should go find somebody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it seems like your company has had pretty significant growth because you started in 2013, 2014-ish around that area, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's amazing to have that kind of growth. Like I was looking at it and it's, it's unbelievable that kind of growth that you've had. So what kind of advice would you give to new entrepreneurs who might just be starting in those beginning phases of their business so that they can grow and scale? Like how did you get up to that level and what advice would you give to those people? Sure. Um, I love that question. And uh, it is, you have to be kind of comfortable not knowing everything and you have to kind of be comfortable. I, you know, if somebody says, what are your three words or, or, you know, of advice, I say, always move forward. Yeah. So every day you're moving forward and you cannot wait for, you know, perfection is the, or yeah, perfection is the enemy of the good or wh whatever the phrase is. Yeah. Um, you won't know all of the things that you're up against, but you do have to go forth and do kind of like we were talking about a little bit earlier before we were on air is that you'll find out later what you do and don't know. Um, you're obviously aren't going to violate the law because you, yeah. you know, you're, <laughs> you know, your internal compass is going to keep you from making those types of mistakes. But yeah, just press on out and do whatever your product or service is. Just go out and be aggressive with it. And you will not probably, you know, everything won't work uh, and you'll fail left and right. And you have to be okay with that. Uh, the one quote I like to use is uh, Mario Andretti, which is uh, kind of a, an older retired uh, race car driver now. But he said, if everything seems completely under control, you're not going fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's really true from, you know, I from my experience is there's days when you kind of sit there in your home office with nobody to, nobody to hang out with and, and you just kind of don't know what to do. Uh, and it can be a little overwhelming at times, but you just have to keep moving forward. And that's why I think podcasts are a absolutely great resource uh, because not everybody has that motivation and I'm kind of a motivated guy and yeah. I don't have it all the time. So I like, li I like to listen to Gary V. Um, he's kind of my go-to for when I need to snap out of my, uh, lazy self, uh, laziness <laughs> and, and go forward. Um, but I also have some, uh, some, uh, entrepreneur clients and in truth and advertising, I will say, uh, we tend to chuckle about if we, if we would have known, you know, then what we know now about how hard the road would be, we probably wouldn't have done it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I can totally uh, relate. so you have to be up for the challenge and, uh, some folks have, if, uh, you know, when I test that, if somebody's like, hey, Steve, you're a successful entrepreneur, uh, you know, what, what do you think? I have an idea. Should I do it? And the first thing, if, if, if the atmosphere is right, I will say, absolutely not. You are not the right person to do something like this. You'll fail miserably. <laughs> and then I pause and I watch the reaction. 
and then uh, hopefully they don't try to take a swing at me. But the, uh, <laughs> but I said, now that was an academic response on my part, but it was a test because you had one of two reactions when I said those words. You either said, that guy's a jerk. He's absolutely wrong. I'm going to, you know, the heck with that guy. That means you're probably going to succeed. If you said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> then it's like, eh, you probably aren't going to, you, you're, you're going to, you know, last for a while, but then you'll probably eventually fade. So you really have to make sure that you're up for the challenge. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I know even in experiences in my own life, like when I was in grade 12, I was applying to university and you know, I was the kid who took the, the applied courses. Like here in Canada, we have applied and we have academic streams. So if you're in, your, if you're in the applied, they kind of, when I was in school, they kind of said, like, okay, you're like the dumb kid, right? Like you're in those classes. Or you can take the academic and go the university stream. And I took applied all through high school because that's what I was told that I should do. And, you know, I took it, I just kind of coasted, you know, I got by. It was what it was. But come grade 12, when I tried to say, I want to go to university and be a teacher because I love to inspire people. I love to teach them something new that they've never done before and see them apply that and take control of their life. You know, it's really right. amazing to see those kind of results. But my English teacher told me, don't even bother applying to university. You'll never succeed. And kind of like what you were saying, I had, a, I had a choice to make there. And I said, well, you know what? Screw this guy. Right. I'm going to prove him wrong. <laughs> And I, you know, I ended up going to university, passed with, you know, honors, all this kind of great stuff. But it's in those moments when people are going after that success, you know, you're going to face those roadblocks and you have that choice to make to say, I'm either going to allow what the world's going to give to me, or I'm going to make my own opportunity. And, you know, you have to be the person, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to have that mindset to say, I'm making my own opportunities here and no one's going to stop me. You know, yeah. and, I and think I think, that's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's such an important thing to, to be as an entrepreneur that kind of, you have to have that drive in you and you have to have that passion for what you're doing. So it really goes back to what you were saying, like, you know, shoot before you're ready and then aim as you kind of go along. Right. I think that's so true. And, and I don't know how there's no secret sauce that I've found or that anybody that I've at least listened to or read has found of on how to come up with that, um, that self-confidence, the, the comfortableness with going forward, knowing that you're going to mess some stuff up and it's never really, you know, it's not going to be perfect right away until you're, you know, on top of things. And then you're like, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't really know other than, you know, listening to other people that have done it. Yeah. Um, you know, how to get that level of self-confidence, but it certainly is required to, uh, to be yeah. su successful as an entrepreneur. Yeah. I think a big part of that is getting a strong reason why behind why you want to do something, right? Like if you're someone like taking the fighter pilot example, you know, if you're someone who says, well, you know, I, I would like to fly a fighter pilot, but you know, I don't really want to go through the math part of it. You know, I don't right. know if that's for me, then you're never going to be a fighter pilot, right? Like it is what it is. Like you either say, okay, I want to be a fighter pilot because I want to serve my country, right? Like I want to be the first person in the air. I want to be the person that goes over there and drops the first bomb, you know, because that's my service to my country, right? Or you're the person yeah. who says, well, it'd be nice. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be something fun to try. <laughs> they're, they're the people who are sitting on the couch playing the video game doing it, right? Right. The that's, entrepreneur that's right. is the one who wants to go out there and do it. They have a strong enough reason why they want to go after it. And those are the people who succeed, in my opinion. Yep, I, I completely agree. And for every successful entrepreneur you see out there, there's, you know, thousands of hours. It may not, it may look easy or like when I have two little girls and they look at the, like the, you know, singers and other like rap artists and mm -hmm. things, it's, it's they're like, oh, it's so easy for them. I'm like, I, I wouldn't make that <laughs> assumption. I would assume that they have been working like 16 hours a day since they were five yeah. years old, because yeah. that's kind of what it takes is you need to just be able to outwork everybody else. And, you yeah. know, that's far more important than the specific level of talent you have is that drive and, and work ethic. Yeah. It's kind of like what Zig Ziglar said. You have to put, I think it was Zig Ziglar anyway, you got to put in your 10,000 hours. Yeah. Right. It's like yeah. looking at that ice, that, um, I don't even know that iceberg, right. You only see the tip, but underneath it's this massive thing and that's what builds the power. Right. Right. But anyways, let's get back on track. Um, so 
there might be some listeners here who are maybe a little bit younger, like maybe teenagers. Sure. Um, what, you know, maybe they just got their first job. You know, what kind of advice would you give to them for planning for their future? Okay, absolutely. Uh, from an investing side, if you can get yourself to be interested in investing early in life, time is your biggest advantage. You can be a, a terrible investor and still end up way better off than somebody that doesn't, doesn't invest. Um, so the time is to get started when you're young. That's not high on your priority list. I understand that. But as you watch movies, as you see other people in society and you're like, gosh, boy, that looks like a very nice house or a nice car. Or, uh, you know, those are things that I would like to, to have during my life. And, you know, money is not everything, but it is, you know, it does facilitate things. Um, you need to get involved and, and start to put money away at a young age and then in, in, invest that money. Um, so that's what I'd say from the investing side. From the entrepreneur side, I would say there, there's, you know, kind of what I, the old school kind of my age, I'm 50. So, you know, I'm old. Um, but when I grew up, it was everybody should go to, you know, either tech school is what we called it. Um, you know, tech school to go get a specific skill to, to serve a function in society, or you're going to the university, and then you're going to go add value to an existing enterprise. So you study accounting, you go be an accountant at a big firm. And that really misses a large portion of people. And that's what I tell younger folks is you can still do that. And if you're comfortable doing that with that, but that can only get you so far. Mm -hmm. I go, if you are interested in doing your own thing that you are passionate about, there's another avenue other than getting a skill set or, you know, going to school to add value to somebody else. And that's creating value from scratch. And well, that's what entrepreneurs do. Mm -hmm. You create a podcast, you create your YouTube channel, you create your service or your product. And if it has value, which, you know, eventually the market will tell you if it does or doesn't, yeah. but, but if it has value, you can create value from scratch. And that is so satisfying to a certain mm -hmm. portion of the population. And not everybody, I, I understand that. But uh, certainly, and what, what I think, you know, it, it tends to be older folks tend to look at the younger folks and say, oh, uh, you know, good for nothing kids. And the, the young kids look at the old people, it's like, well, they don't understand it. That'll probably still go on. But when you look at like TikTok or Snapchat, and when you look at the creative ability of today's kids, you know, that are eight, nine, you know, started eight or nine, they're producing, I mean, a lot of bad stuff, but they're producing some yeah. amazing stuff. But yeah. what, they're, what they're finding is they're in their own little market research, whether they know this or not. My, I started talking to my daughters about this and their eyes mm -hmm. like glassed over. But you're doing market research. is You're trying mm -hmm. a video, seeing if it gets any likes, and you're like, okay, well, now I learned. And you tweak it and you do something else next time. And they're, they're kind of learning what I call the game from a very early age. So I'm pretty mm -hmm. optimistic to see this group, they're different. Sure. You know, Gen Z, you know, every generation is different, but they're really different. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the whole world is right there in their hand and it, yeah. it always has been. Uh, but I'm excited to see the, the level of entrepreneurship that, that comes out of mm -hmm. those, those young folks. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, even my nephew, like he's, he's starting a YouTube channel as well, which is really cool. And, you know, he's posting every day, kind of like this works, this doesn't. And, you know, it's just amazing to see like, even the transformation, like, cause when I was a kid, like we didn't even have internet yet. Or like, when we, it was very like new, like we had the dial up right. tone, right? You know, that, <laughs> that horrible noise that would happen. And then you'd just get connected and the phone would pick up and that'd be it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you have to endure that horrible noise again. But like right. now, like you were saying, everyone has the whole world in their hand, right? And seeing that market research that's happening, like people aren't afraid to try something new which is yeah. amazing to see. And, you know, the people who are afraid, like what advice would you give to someone who might be afraid to start something new? Well, it would be just what you said is, uh, you know, you need to, I think, and when I talk to kids, you know, compete at a young age. And to a certain extent, you know, taken to TikTok or Snapchat is competing in the larger uh, world. But I think playing sports um, or being in the choir band, you know, mm -hmm. other activities, uh, to where you lose as a kid and you win as, mm -hmm. as a child, you know, to kind of get some of those emotions behind you. Um, mm -hmm. My daughters uh, both play volleyball at, at a pretty competitive level and I'm kind of tall. Mm -hmm. So they're turning out to be pretty tall. Um, <laughs> so it, it's the, but, you know, talking with them, it's like, you know, it's okay to cry when you're 10 and you just lost a big game. It's not okay to 
cry when you're 26 in the office and your boss says, um, here's three things you need to work on that, you know, that shouldn't inspire the, uh, the emotions <laughs> that comes up. You're right. So it's, you know, go out there, win and lose. It takes both sides. And yeah. that way you kind of get past that, uh, hesitation, if you will. Um, but yeah, those folks that can take to, you know, creating w whatever kind of social media is out there, I think they're going to be tough, tough folks out there. Cause they're used to the online trolls and the, you know, every 10th comment is something negative. Uh, you know, so they kind of get past that phase, uh, yeah, pretty quickly. Yeah. So, um, with everything that's going on relating with COVID, right? Like we're in that pandemic mode. Um, I know it's running rampant in the States. It's not as much here in Canada right now, but I know in the States, like I see it all the time on the news, like it's running rampant down there. Right. Now, are you finding people that are having, you know, a lot of people are having financial hardship, I'm sure. Like a lot of people are out of work, out of jobs. Um, I'm sure you guys have some type of stimulus package or something going on down there. Now, what advice would you give to those people who may have find, found themselves out of, out of a job, you know, who maybe don't know what their next step is financially? You know, they've taken a hit. What can they do to kind of start recovering themselves um, from this kind of, you know, economic collapse? Right. The, for a little bit of background on that, what, what was weird about this time? is, and I alluded to it earlier, you know, the market will let you know if your product or service is good or not. Um, so if you if you fail as a business owner, you just kind of have to say, well, I was at least a little bit of fault, right? <laughs> You're not completely, uh, yeah. you know, fault free, if you will. But what was so different about when COVID-19 shows up and we shut down is now you have successful people that through no fault of their own, uh, whether they were entry level worker B or the boss or the owner, mm -hmm through no fault of their own, they're all of a sudden out and they're looking at that, you know, either immediate failure or looking at the numbers. It's like, um, I might be able to make it three months and, you know, fake it till I make it. Uh, you know, but it, it's weird because uh, it's through no fault of their own. So we did have a mm -hmm. fairly significant stimulus package uh, passed already. We're getting ready to pass another one. Uh, we'll see how those turn out uh, for the long term because we're throwing a, a lot of dollars a, yeah. into just kind of keeping everybody afloat. Um, but uh, what I was talking to with with my clients who were affected is there's a there's a time to fight and that's when you're faced with it and it's a it's at the hardest moment. So when we started, you know, that February ish, you started hearing more and more of the mm -hmm. Wuhan. You know, everybody we didn't know what to call it. Uh, people are blaming each other, you know, it's kind of the, you know, people didn't know, uh, people yeah. were going on Facebook and, you know, making themselves a doctor and telling telling the world what, what it was, and what it wasn't, right? But, so it, it was funny, but it was also unnerving because nobody really mm -hmm. knew how it was going to, you know, there's people out there like, oh, this is made up. And it's like, well, no, it's not. Um, yeah. But uh, from a perspective, when they, you know, officially declared it a pandemic and the U.S. stock market crashed and they're telling restaurants and bars that, uh, you know, you're closing shop and you can't open, uh, that was the time to fight. And yeah. it's the, it, it's so tough, you know, we're all human. We all have bad days. And those are the days when you just want to shut down, uh, turn the lights off. You know, it's like the lights even hurt today. So <laughs> turn, turn the lights off, go to your safe space and just pretend that it all isn't happening. But that's absolutely the wrong reaction. You have to go out there and uh, fight for yourself, fight for your family and fight for your, your employees uh, as the leader and be a completely transparent. Like, yeah, this is not good. We are looking at, we can, at, we, I can pay you for a month. And if I don't get help, uh, this say we're going to, you know, that's going to be it. So that's, that's what I was encouraging folks to do. Uh, I didn't see it personally as much, but I saw it through some of my clients that were small business owners that were in, right in that niche where you just, all of a sudden it was like, you're closing. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> but, but I can't close, right? Yeah, this is my <laughs> you know, business. What, what part of my business plan had, yeah. <laughs> you will be forced to close your door for no reason other than, you know, some unforeseen pandemic comes in. Yeah. So. So it was, it was a crazy time. It still is to a certain extent, as, mm -hmm. you know, as you mentioned, you know, I'm in one of the hotbed states, if you will, in Texas, you know, California, Texas, and Florida, yeah. where, yeah, we were pretty aggressive at opening back up. 
and we paid the price for that a little bit. Yeah. Um, nobody knows in the long term what the right answer will have been, yeah. uh, but certainly it's on everybody's mind. Every time we go outside, we have our mask and you distance yeah. and, and kind of do it, it. It changes the way you live. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's a huge thing too, you know, like having that mindset around like, I'm either going to fight or I'm going to take flight in this moment when, when something yeah. bad happens. And I think every entrepreneur that goes through their entrepreneur career, you know, you're going to be faced with something like that. Um, I remember reading in Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. Mm-hmm. I don't remember who it was, but when that whole place kind of, that whole city like basically burned down and the one person said, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to rebuild because that's what I do. You know, everyone else just kind of picked up and left. And they ended up making a multi-million dollar business out of it because they stayed and they fought. And I think the mindset around, you know, when something bad happens, you have that choice again. You know, I'm either going to fight for what I want, what I deserve, or I'm going to close up. I'm going to, you know, go under the covers and hope everything just works itself out. And if you go under the covers, chances are it's not going to work out. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It was a tough time there at the beginning. And, you know, governments can only do so much um, yep. to come in and try to help you out. And I, I think the U.S. has done a pretty good job uh, at that. We won't know the answer to that till yeah. later, you know, years later. But yeah. so far, it seems about right. And there, we have lots of issues we're kind of working through as a country. Yeah. But as a whole, we're helping people that need help exactly. and, and, you know, trying to rally around beating this thing. Yeah. And I think, too, like because of this pandemic, it's giving new opportunities to these entrepreneurs to find new ways that they can serve their customers. I mean, even with me, you know, I'm a motivational speaker and author and stuff. So, you know, I couldn't hold, you know, a big group of people together and do a presentation because we weren't allowed to have more than, you know, five people meet in a right. in closed space. So that made me shift my focus instead of just saying, okay, well, that's it. I'm not a motivational speaker anymore you know, there's no audience to talk to. I had to shift my perspective and go, okay, now I'm going to service people online. I'm going to create this podcast. I'm going to buff up my YouTube channel, you know, whatever it takes, you have to be willing to make that pivot. And I've seen that with a lot of companies, even around here, you know, they're shifting to an online focus, which is really good. You know, that's how they can service people and they can also keep their costs down. But um, what would you say, just kind of shifting gears here again, a little bit, um, let me just see. So you said you're clearly passionate about helping people achieve that financial freedom and developing a strategy for them to build wealth. How did you discover this as being your passion? It started like early, early age, even before I saw Top Gun, there was a show uh, in the U.S. called Family Ties, uh, which had Michael J. Fox, who played a character named Alex P. Keaton. And it, you know, pretty nerdy character. Uh, and he was, you know, carrying a briefcase and high school or whatever it was. Um, but I've always kind of, I was an only child. I, I, I attribute some of it to being an only child and I lived out in the country. So I had time to think about things. Um, so it was the, I kind of saw the genius of, okay, let me plan my life out. And I've always been able to visualize myself uh, at different stages, which I think has been a key to success for me mm-hmm. is because when I saw the movie Top Gun and I said, I'm going to do that, I actually, I was serious. I wasn't yeah. like little, little kid, you know, <laughs> I'm going to go do that. It's like, no, I'm actually dead serious. I'm actually going to go do that. I, I, I have to, um, cause that's perfect. That's exactly what I want to do. Um, so that, but the whole investing thing, it, I got started early. My parents, uh, set me up with, the, you know, they told me that my job going through school was to get good grades and I went, okay, you know, I'll do that. So I, I probably studied and worked a lot harder than, that I didn't know any better because I lived out in the country by myself. So I was like, okay, uh, I can do that. Uh, but I got kind of smart. And then when I turned uh, 16, they said, okay, uh, you need to go get a job. And I was like, point of order. Uh, you said for the past several years that my job was to get good grades. Here's my grades. Uh, you know, what is this go get a job thing? And they said, well, you need earned income so we can match. You know, if you make a thousand dollars, you get to keep the money. And we're going to match that into an IRA for you. Nice. And that way it can work towards your retirement. I went, hmm, sounds like free money. And I've always yeah. had kind of an <laughs> ear for free money. So 
that's what, you know, and I, I advise everybody to do that that has kids and you have the means to be able to cough up a couple thousand dollars now. Um, if you don't, take care of yourselves first. But if you do have the means, then yeah, get your kids started early. It'll change their life. So by me starting that early, you know, going into my military career, just investing through the, you know, crash of 87 and then 2000, the tech bubble, and then 2007 to, through, through 2009, I was a little more nimble then. So I was a little more sophisticated. But uh, yeah, it's the, those drops bring opportunities and that kind of set me up to where I am today. And part of my giving back and just like you, I speak as well. And, and I miss the interface with the crowd. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> the podcast is really tough because it's just you know, in the nothingness when you're yeah. recording it. Right. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, as part of my giving back is I like to talk about flying because I was very privileged to do one of the greatest jobs on earth. Mm -hmm. And then I like to talk about finances because through, more circumstance than anything else. I started early and I stayed with it. Uh, that's not genius. That's just, you know, discipline, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. Got to me where I'm financially independent in my late forties. So I wanted to give back to everybody else and kind of share with the, hey, this you can do this. Uh, yeah. you know, it's exactly what I did. It, it's not as scary as you think. You do need to get started soon, whether with me or somebody else or on your own, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> but it does, it's not going to happen automatically. So you need to start something, stick with it, and uh, it'll change your life. It really will. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so as we kind of end this off, what would you say success means to you? Well, I have an interesting definition of success. Um, <laughs> success to me is freedom of schedule. Yeah. The, the number one thing that I, you know, and I, I have to caveat that, I would not have said that at 16 or at 22, <laughs> Uh, but once you've gone through the discipline and, and, you know, and stuck with a plan to where you're financially independent, then it's absolutely my time and how I want to spend my time and how can I maximize my value? Um, you know, as a speaker, you know that it, it's, it's amazing to be able to talk to one person and maybe change their day or help them out. But if you can get a platform to where yeah. now you can all of a sudden be affecting people that you might never even meet. That's really how you can use that, you know, efficiency yeah. of, of your time of here's a message. And if it resonates and helps you, then fantastic. That's what I want to do as a speaker, author, uh, you know, business person. Um, so that's my, but so right now, you know, very guarded yeah. with my time. I still have girls that are uh, one in high school, one in middle school. So yeah. family is very important to me. Mm -hmm. I work from home. Uh, I say I work from home before, working from home is cool. Uh, you know, so, you know, for the past six years, I've worked from home. I'm very transparent with my clients that uh, if you want to go to the 12th story downtown Austin, you're going to have to find somebody else because uh, I think it's ridiculous to pay, uh, you know, 20000 a month for that. And I would just pass, I would just pass the cost on to you, the client. Um, so why don't we save ourselves that drill? I'll, I'll give you a nice uh, lower rate and uh, we can either meet at the house or now, of course, through Zoom. Yeah. is how pretty much uh, conducting um, business now. So. Nice. So where can people find you if they want to get a hold of you or maybe schedule a consultation with you? Sure. Uh, I have two businesses. So finding me online, of course, is, uh, is you know, everybody's doing that now. Um, two businesses. One is Afterburner Financial. So just either Google those two words or afterburner-financial.com. Um, there's a contact me. Um, before you do that, surf around a little bit. Uh, you know, we'll, you, you, if you're going to talk finances with somebody, they, they need to be somebody that you would like to hang out with too. I mean, mm -hmm. there has to be some, because you're going to talk about some really personal stuff. And I've had to tell clients, you know, things like uh, you are not on a plan that's going to get you anywhere near where you <laughs> think you're going. So we need to be able to communicate kind of like best friends would yeah. um, <laughs> sort of thing. So, so yeah, surf around, you can reach out through there. Or if you just want to hear some more, I have my podcast called On Time on Target. Uh, so I have OTOTnow.com is kind of where you can start or just let's pull up on time on target. I'm the only one out there and anywhere you consume podcasts and uh, listen in. If you, if you think I'm crazy, tune out. If you like what you hear, uh, tell your friends and uh, you can reach out to me through the, uh, through the web, through the podcast uh, website as well. Awesome. And links to all that stuff will be down below in the description. So anyone who wants to check out Steve's website and podcast, be sure to do that. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time today, Steve. I really appreciate you coming on, sharing your story, you know, kind of taking us through, you know, from the skies to the finances. So um, really appreciate you being on here.
Yes, Jacob, thank you so much. And uh, good luck with everything that you're doing, trying to, you know, positivity and success and, and passing on your experiences out there to everybody as well. So it's great stuff. All right. Thank you so much.